good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Christopher Riopel. I'm the Neil Westreich Curator of um, painting, Paintings here at the National Gallery, uh, Paintings after 1800 here at the National Gallery, and along with my uh, colleague Emily Talbot uh, from the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, California, the co-curator of the current exhibition on view in room 46 upstairs, Picasso and Face to Face. And there you have it, the entire exhibition. Uh, this does not in any way preclude you from going upstairs, uh, in fact, or coming in for, to those uh, online, uh, to see this extraordinary conjunction of two paintings uh, almost a century uh, apart. Often as a curator, uh, one is asked, how long has it taken to do this exhibition? Is it one year, two year, three, five years? People are often surprised uh, how long it takes. In this case, the answer is 86 years. <laughs> and I will explain that uh, to you, the, the reason, the raison d'etre for bringing together these two paintings that at the same time uh, resemble one another very closely, but do not resemble one another uh, at all. Jean-Dominique um, Auguste Eng's portrait of Madame Moitessier, uh, a painting begun in 1844 and finished in 1856, a painting of 12 years uh, in its uh, creation, uh, and uh, facing it, uh, Pablo Picasso's a uh, woman reading a book, a portrait of his young lover at the time, Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, a work of uh, 1932, um, obviously in the debt of the Madame Moitessier, which may have taken two, three, four days uh, to complete. And we will come, come back to that in a bit. Uh, let me give you a bit of background on this relationship between the National Gallery and the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena. Uh, Norton Simon was a great American industrialist who uh, in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s, uh, assembled perhaps one of the last great private collections of old masters and modern uh, masters in America, that land of, of the creation of uh, great, great um, exhibitions, uh, uh, great, great collections, obviously in a kind of context, uh, contest with his um, uh, near neighbor in Los Angeles, uh, J. Paul Getty, arguably assembling even a greater collection during his lifetime uh, than Getty uh, did, and who in the mid-1960s took over uh, not a hostile takeover, but a takeover nonetheless of the pre-existing Pasadena Museum, uh, a museum famous for its own collection of uh, modern American art, modern German art, and a scene of very important uh, exhibitions, including in 1962, the great reintroduction of Marcel Duchamp uh, as a central figure of modern art. It took place uh, in uh, this building, as you see it here, um, a uh, clad in these wonderful um, ceramic uh, bricks, as you see, but then in a very recent uh, restoration, uh, opened up every, every wall that wasn't load-bearing. Uh, the great Frank Gehry took out the wall and replaced it with glass, uh, as you see on the left here. So you have this mixture of very intimate enclosed galleries with brilliant light, California light uh, streaming in. It really is uh, a uniquely beautiful place uh, to look at, uh, at art, not only European, but also one of the great collections of, of Indian uh, sculpture in, uh, in the world in this Monet-like garden as you see it, uh, as you see it here. Uh, it remains very much a private collection, the Norton Simon, and uh, the Simon lends only to three institutions, and always where their picture will, will be the subject, where, where new information will be brought to bear on works in their collection. 
um, the assignment lends to the Frick Collection in New York, to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and to the National Gallery here in, uh, in London. Um, and this uh, bringing together of the Picasso with our Ang is the second in what we very much hope will be an ongoing series of, uh, of exhibitions here. The exhibition focuses on the portrait of Madame Moitessier by Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang, man born at the, in the later years of the 18th uh, century in the south of France, the son of a minor artist, but whose talent was very, very quickly recognized. And at the end of the 18th century, the young boy of really 16, 17, is sent north to Paris and into the greatest studio of art in revolutionary Paris, the studio of Jacques-Louis uh, David, uh, the great chronicler of the French Revolution, which had erupted in 1789. David realized almost immediately that this young um, gauche provincial boy arriving uh, from the south of France was in fact his most brilliant student ever, uh, the one who would force his own, um, uh, his own studio in new directions. We will see uh, by uh, not very long into the 19th century, David was already saying of this man whom he knew was his greatest student, he's mad, he's insane, I don't know where he's going with his art. And I will, I will tell you some of that, of what David saw as his problems with this young student. But very early on, he showed uh, one, a unique classical uh, painting style, absolutely enamel-like surfaces. You never, in paintings like this portrait of Napoleon of 1806, you never see a brush stroke. He's working with tiny brushes in minute application of paint so that the surface of the picture when he is completed, when he has completed it, is like enamel. You see no, we're used to seeing uh, brush stroke as expressive of the artist's personality. There is absolutely none of that uh, in uh, Ang's portraits. Nonetheless, they are extraordinary in their impact. They are extraordinary, and I will come back to this over and again, they are extraordinary in their strangeness. Uh, it's as if uh, you are entering a different sphere of reality. He received, as a young man, he had won in, in 1801 the Prix de Rome. That was, he was meant to be sent to Rome to study there at the font of antiquity, at the font of the Renaissance. But in 1801, France was broke. There was no money left to send him there. So he lingered in Paris for five more years. It was only in 1806 that he, the funds came together that allowed him to travel to, uh, to Rome. But before he left, he painted this monumental depiction of the emperor uh, who is not like a human being. He is, he is this uh, apparition in front of us in his imperial robes. Uh, Ang had been looking at the uh, great Ghent altarpiece by Van Eyck, similar enamel surface to the paint, uh, a similar absolute frontality where, where it is as if we are confronting a god or God himself in an image like this. And this was um, David, who had painted Napoleon often, was his first intimation that this uh, brilliant student of his was going off in a very odd direction in his, uh, in his mind. He goes to Rome in 1806, and of course, a few years later, the French, under Napoleon, take over Italy. Napoleon becomes the king of Italy as well. His, his young son becomes the king of Rome. Um, 
administrators, French administrators, flock down to, um, to uh, Rome to run the country on behalf of Napoleon, one of these being Monsieur de Norvin, um, uh, who was the chief of police in French Rome during the Napoleonic uh, occupation. A man, Stendhal himself, knew him and said he is truly awful. <laughs> and he is, of course, the model for Puccini's ta uh, for uh, uh, the chief of police, police in uh, Puccini's uh, Tosca Scarpia. Uh, he is also one of the first people to flee. Uh, already in, in 1814, he begins to sense that uh, Napoleon is going to fall and he is one of the first to leave. And I don't know if you, when you go upstairs and look at the picture, work to get the right angle. On the upper left, um, he had painted, Ang had painted behind this uh, um, figure of Dorvin, a bust in marble of the King of Rome, that is Napoleon's son, pledging uh, Norvin's uh, uh, loyalty to Napoleon. When he fled, the last thing he does is get uh, 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 Ang to repaint the painting and paint out that bust. Uh, but oil paint becomes transparent over time, and when you're upstairs, Look closely at the picture at the upper left, and you will see the ghostly head of this child now coming through the curtain that he has painted uh, over it, as if the, the return of the repressed, as it were. Um, and I think Napoleon uh, Ang knew that would happen, and I think he's telling us somehow in the malevolence of the face, in those small pursed lips, in the hand, in the vest, in imitation of Napoleon himself, that we are faced with a dubious and duplicitous person uh, in, this, uh, in this portrait. And that is um, uh, something I will keep coming back to as we talk. It is Ang's ability, even though he shows his own touch, his own personality, uh, in these pictures, very little. The technique is absolutely uh, superb, absolutely masterful. If we look long enough, we begin to figure out, just like you would in Rembrandt, just like you would in Titian, we begin to figure out what Ang actually thinks of these people who are sitting to him. That is certainly the case uh, with his portrait of the Vicomtesse de Senon, uh, a woman, uh, uh, Marie Marcos was her name, a Lyonnaise uh, woman who had married and divorced uh, by 1812, was living in, uh, in Rome during the occupation, a sort of society hostess uh, in, um, uh, in Rome at that time, and the mistress of the Marquis de Senon, of the Vicomte de Senon, uh, not yet married to him, but uh, very much on the public scene as his, as his mistress. It is one of the supreme works of this Roman period in um, uh, early Ang, and I point out two things that we will come back to. One is the reflection in the mirror, the fact that we see her twice. Uh, her head, and then this perfect, as it were, oval of the reflection in the mirror. So we see her riches, we see the rather overly ornate jewelry uh, on, her, uh, on her fingers, dangling from her ears around her neck in this sumptuous picture in which we can almost have a tactile sense of all of the materials, uh, the velvet, the satin, the cashmere, all of them working uh, together in the most extraordinary uh, way, as if she is leaning forward to share, uh, share a bit of gossip with us or something like this. The other thing I would ask you to look at is her right arm. Uh, if she stood up, that arm would practically drag along the ground. <laughs> it is far too long, and yet it is perfectly 
expressive of what he wants to say about her languidness, uh, it, the way it rhymes with the cashmere shawl across the back of the couch. And you will see this over and over again, uh, much to the horror of his teacher David, Ang is always willing to um, <coughs> break with naturalism in, in, to the benefit of the design of the picture. It suits his purpose here to give her this long, lingering arm, and so he, uh, he doesn't care about naturalism anymore. He is happy to do that. Uh, the other thing, and this, one, one would have to bring a great deal um, uh, to it to understand, but Aileen Ribeiro, the great historian of costume, points out that Ang's signature on this picture is a calling card stuck in the mirror. Oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that clever of Ang to put his name on a calling card stuck in a mirror? Um, but as Aileen Ribeiro points out, no woman of the actual aristocracy, as it were, would do anything as louche as that to put a gentleman's calling card in her mirror. He is telling us, if we know how to look, that this is a kept woman, that this is not someone um, wh whom, and, and, and Aang, in fact, was rather conventional in his own life and very conscious of social status, etc. And he is playing uh, with that here in this extraordinary, uh, really remarkable, one of the most remarkable portraits of the early 19th century. Similarly, 1814, Napoleon falls. 1815, he falls again a second time at the Battle of Waterloo. It's the, the Napoleonic adventure is over. Europe, which had been a closed shop, as it were, for almost 15 years, now was open again. Uh, the people began to travel again. The English began to travel again and to go down to uh, Italy on the Grand Tour uh, again. All the French left except for Ang. He loved um, Rome more than he loved France, um, though he was still very conscious of trying to become successful in, um, in Paris. But he remains and he makes a very good living, thank you, off of the tourists pouring, the wealthy tourists obviously, pouring into Rome in the years after the um, fall of Napoleon. And here from the Fitzwilliam, one of the most extraordinary um, um, drawings from that period of an English trio. And uh, let me say, because I think it's probably important to understand the caricatural quality that um, Ang brought to drawings like this, he had no English. I don't know if they had French or not, but probably among themselves they spoke English. So there was no or very little oral communication between Ang and these people who were coming to sit for him for these uh, drawings to bring home as trophies from their royal, uh, from their um, grand, uh, grand tour. Uh, and so he, in a sense, lets himself go in how he shows them. Mr. Joseph Woodhead uh, was a very wealthy businessman from Cambridge, actually, uh, as was the, were the Comber uh, family, uh, who were of a much higher social status. Uh, and Mrs. Joseph Woodhead has, has uh, married Mr. Comber. He ha he, she has married down, he has married up. Uh, but he has the money. And you notice the way her hand is like a fish hook around him. Uh, she's got him, uh, and he doesn't quite know what to do with him as she takes control of the situation. And it er, is her unbearable young brother who has joined them on the honeymoon. Uh, and the, the young man on the right gazing at us or gazing at Ang. Uh, with a kind of disdain which he captures with, uh, with perfect ease. It is uh, an absolutely brilliant 
French take on the English, if you, uh, if you will, uh, at that moment. You would come and you would sit to Ang for maybe two hours in the morning. Then you would go away, and the next morning you would come back and pick up this completed thing. Uh, and you would pay a very great deal of money for it, uh, because his absolute mastery <coughs> was, uh, was understood. And one is almost certain that, that Mr. and Mrs. Woodhead and, and Mr. Comber had no idea of the satirical edge to what um, Ang had done with an image like this. So what I'm suggesting is someone, when he is looking at someone, uh, at sitters in his portraits, has ability to draw out things uh, that you might quite un uh, unexpect in what at first glance may look perfectly conventional, uh, are in fact uh, uh, full of very subtle nuance. He married twice, Ang. Uh, his first uh, um, wife, Ma uh, Madeleine Chapelle, was quite literally a mail-order bride. He had never met her. He was told she was quite nice, and he sent for her back in France. Uh, she arrived uh, one morning uh, in the Forum at Rome. He was there to take her off the uh, out of the carriage. As I say, they had never met. They knew nothing about one another, and for 40 years, it was one of the happiest marriages on record. He adored her. And in this portrait on the, uh, on the left, you see a portrait probably painted within a month or two of her arrival uh, at the Roman Forum and their marriage. And it is unfinished. Uh, that enamel surface we're used to in Ang is not there, and that's because he reserved unfinished for only the people whom he loved the most, only his most intimate friends. You see it in the portrait of Madeleine, the face, of course, more finished than the rest of the picture, but this sense of spontaneity, this sense of making it up in direct uh, communication with the sitter uh, makes it, and indeed all of the, <coughs> of the small group of unfinished, so-called unfinished portraits, to be among his most beguiling, intimate, and deeply, deeply personal. Um, she died in the uh, mid-1850s. He was bereft, but uh, a few years later, in 58, I believe it is, he, uh, no, in, in 55, he uh, marries uh, the woman on the right, Delphine Ramel. Again, it was a marriage of love. He hardly knew her, but it was a marriage of, uh, of love. They were extremely happy. Uh, this is a highly, highly finished portrait. What is the difference? Why in this intimate portrait as young people in Rome, unfinished, of... Um, Delphine Ramel, whom he loved as much, so finished, so enamel-like in its surface. And I think that has to do a great deal with the difference between private and public. By the time he married Delphine Ramel, he was the most famous artist in Paris. She was, by definition of marrying and a public figure. She would appear on his arm at the opera, at the annual salon, any of <coughs> those things. And so she had to be presented uh, not with the Im intimacy of, uh, of Madeleine, which would not have been proper to her position. So she too receives a very highly polished and finished portrait uh, like uh, the one we see on the, uh, on the right. He... And comes back to Paris in 19, 18, excuse me, 24. He's uh, famous from the moment he comes back throughout the 1820s into the 30s. He is one of the most famous uh, artists in Paris. David is dead by this point and having despaired of where Ang was going. He receives important commissions, uh, from, including from uh, the Duc d'Orléans, the heir to the throne, the eldest son of King Louis 
uh, Philippe, who orders the picture you see on your left, Antiochus and Stratonis, uh, an ancient uh, Greek story set here in, in a sort of Pompeian interior. Antiochus is dying on his sickbed for love of his father's wife, not his mother, his stepmother, and he can do nothing about it. The doctor is feeling his pulse. This guy's going to die so passionate is his love for the demure uh, Stratonis, whom you see on the left. This is a work that took many, many years to complete, and Eng, in the meantime, had returned to Rome and is working on it for the Duc d'Orléans in, uh, in Rome, when the woman on the right, the Comtesse d'Azonville, uh, a great, great French aristocrat, visits with her husband, who was at that point like the Secretary of State in the French uh, government. She sees this picture on um, Ang's easel in Rome uh, and decides she wants her portrait painted in basically the same pose. And they work together uh, on it, setting up the pose, etc. Uh, it's more or less the same pose as that of Stratonice, though she is in modern dress. And this is one of the innovations of Ang's portraiture in these years, that oscillation between modern dress, this is a modern woman, uh, a Paris society figure, uh, a grand aristocrat, and the reverberation, the oscillation uh, with uh, the classical past. So uh, uh, endowing uh, this, this uh, portrait with something of the air of myth, of antiquity uh, to it. Uh, not only that, but when the um, uh, Antiochus and Stratonice is finished, um, it is uh, sent to Paris, and the Duke d'Orléans, the heir to the throne of France, has a private view in his own apartments in the Tuileries Palace. And Madame d'Ausonville and all her friends are invited. So then when they see Ang's portrait, they alone among all Paris, because uh, the picture is not shown in public, realize the source. It's sort of an, if you will, an in-joke uh, among them uh, to, to recognize the source for, uh, for this uh, extraordinary painting. And it is the second time in which, as you see on the right, in the portrait of the Comtesse d'Ausonville, he uses the reflection, the back of the head, in a mirror. He's becoming more and more fascinated with this, with being able to see your sitter twice, uh, as it were. And it's at that moment, perhaps in 1844, uh, that he receives this commission. He's reluctant to take it at first. Uh, he's accepting at that point, accepting uh, portrait commissions only from the absolute height of the aristocracy. Uh, Madame Moitessier is not aristocracy. She is a young woman of 23 at this point who has just married a much older man, Monsieur de Moitessier. Her family name is de Foucault. Um, uh, she marries a much older man, a, uh, a man who's made his money and a lot of money uh, in Cuban tobacco. So not quite the same thing as a princess like um, Madame d'Azonville. He's reluctant to take it at first, but when they're introduced, the story goes, uh, he is overcome by her beauty and agrees to paint this portrait uh, uh, of, of a, an upper middle class uh, Parisian uh, woman. And he starts work on it in 1844, um, and it takes him forever. He works and he works and he works and he stops and he starts. His first wife, uh, Madeleine, dies and he's bereft for two years, does, uh, does nothing. Um, originally, Madame Montessier had just had a young child, a girl, a daughter, and the daughter was meant to be in the picture with her, leaning her childish head on her mother's lap. Uh, but the thing goes on and on and on. Uh, the girl grows up. Uh, she would look a little silly lying, laying her head <coughs> as a 14 or 15 year old on her mother's lap. So she is edited out. And at that point, we know from investigations in our own labs upstairs, um, 
the portrait is taken off its stretcher move, and moved to the right. That is, uh, Madame, who used to be closer to the left side of the canvas so that her daughter could fit in, now the daughter is gone, so she's moved dead center, opening up space to both, uh, to both right and, uh, and left. And we'll come back to other changes that, uh, that go on in the portrait at that time. But the most extraordinary thing is this hand, the, uh, the hand raised to the head, this absolutely boneless fingers uh, drooping down. Um, it is, in fact, a, a direct quotation from antiquity, just like, in a certain sense, the Stratonese figure is a quotation from antiquity, from a fresco at Herculaneum destroyed in, um, in uh, 79 AD, uh, along with Pompeii, and I, don't, I was fascinated to see historians are now telling us the famous eruption was not in, in August, but in November of 79, um, as, as they found graffiti dated in October. Um, but he had gone in 1815 down to Pompeii and Herculaneum, had seen this fresco, had had a copy made that he always had with him, it was in his studio, and uh, in 1844-45, he decided that this would be the model for Madame Watessier. She would be a kind of goddess of the uh, Parisian firmament, like, uh, like the goddess of, of autumn is here in, in this. It is also, I think, and this will uh, become important, the hand raised to the head tells us that this is what we're meant to see is someone in thought, someone who is contemplating, is coming to a, a, a decision, an opinion about what it is she's, she's seeing. It is a gesture connoting uh, a kind of intelligent thinking through of a situation, and I will come back to that uh, later. The husband, Monsieur de Montessier, who's paying for this extremely important uh, and expensive commission is getting more and more irked uh, that the years are going by and nothing is being produced. And he tells um, Ang he has to hurry up and finish this stupid thing or he has to destroy it. So instead of doing either, Ang sits down and paints a second portrait of Madame Watessier, which he does in seven months. Seven months later, it's in his studio and people are coming to, to see it in uh, 1851. I defy you, it's in Washington next time you're, you're there and having looked at ours, I defy you to decide which one, theirs or ours, is more perfectly painted. They're both absolutely the same meticulous uh, uh, touch, but there is a difference. If Madame Watessier seated, our picture shows her in, um, uh, in, in the privacy of her own home, in conversation, thinking about what Ang or whomever it is she's talking to is talking about. This is a public picture. This she is getting prepared to go out for the evening to the opera, to a ball, to some society do, on the arm of her husband. And that, after all, is what he's paying for. In black, uh, uh, ready, her shawl tossed, and gloves, you see, in the lower left, tossed in the couch, waiting for her to pick them up. And out they go into the very public, not quite yet Proustian world of, of Parisian high society. And I think that is, may begin to account for the difference between seven months and 12 years, uh, in that in uh, uh, this picture he's, he is presenting a rather slightly blank uh, public uh, figure on the, in the Parisian firmament, whereas here he is painting her thinking in the privacy of 
her house, engaged in a kind of conversation with Aang himself. Now, we go up to, he, he, having finished the portrait in black, uh, Monsieur Moitessier is satisfied, okay, I've got my portrait. So he leaves Aang to do what he wants with this one. He works on it five more uh, years. Up until the last moment, up until some point in 1855, Madame Moitessier is wearing a yellow dress, and our testing has found the yellow paint underneath this extraordinary flowered silk dress. It is, uh, it is there. That is what it, it was going to be all of those years, a single color. At the last minute, he changes it and paints it very quickly. He can work fast when he wants to. He changes it to this extraordinary uh, flowered silk dress, Lyonnaise silk, uh, flowered silk, which was the rage of the 1855 Universal Exposition. Uh, these these uh, sumptuous silks were being shown there. Uh, the Empress Eugenie had appeared in them. It was absolutely the latest uh, fashion. And so this oscillation between an ancient Roman god, <coughs> he puts her into this absolutely contemporary uh, height of fashion, couture uh, gown, the latest thing off, as it were, the catwalk or uh, in Parisian high society. And that, as I say, uh, he does very quickly at the last moment in the concept, with complete confidence um, uh, at the last moment in the conception. And then he orders this frame for it, working with the frame maker, uh, this flower festooned frame uh, that is meant to go with the dress. It is a, a total work of art, dress and frame together. When, and I'll come back to this, when the picture is acquired in 18, 1936, excuse me, by the National Gallery, uh, by our most famous uh, director, Kenneth Clark, in 1936, uh, the trustees order him to take this frame off. They think it's frivolous. Uh, and even 35 years later in his first volume of his memoirs, Clark is still furious about this. He's still uh, angry that, that, it, that a much more chaste uh, frame was put on the picture. This frame was only rediscovered in 1970 on a uh, Turner painting. I can't imagine the Turner, what Turner would go with this. But anyway, it was restored to this picture in, um, in uh, 1970, thank, thank goodness. Now, often, um, Madame Moitessier has been described as merely a uh, society Paris beauty of no great intellect. Uh, one, one critic says, it's such a great portrait because she herself was so uninteresting. Uh, but this seems not to be the case. She was, as I said, her family was de Foucault, uh, and she was the ward for many years, the guardian for many years of her ward, her orphaned nephew, Charles de Foucault, who was a, um, a, a, an absolutely dissolute soldier in the French army, all the money, and there was a lot of money, going on wine, women, and song, completely dissipated uh, life. She actually took her own ward to court to, to prevent him from throwing his money down the drain in the way he was. And she seems to have been, in ways we don't quite understand, uh, instrumental in his conversion, his return to the church. It was an old, old Catholic family, the de Foucault, but he had drifted far. Uh, but he returned to the church. He became a Trappist monk he was um, uh, assassinated in North Africa in, uh, in 1916 and, <clears throat> as you see, only a month and a half ago, was canonized by the Pope. Um, and she and her two daughters had a long, very rich spiritual um, correspondence with this, uh, with this future uh, saint to whom they are very close, which suggests a whole other world of 
intellect and, and imagination than we might have expected uh, with, uh, with Madame de Moitessier uh, before this. Um, we use in the exhibition upstairs, those of you who've seen it, this wonderful quote from, uh, from Picasso, one's work is a way of keeping a, a diary, and everyone understands this in terms of Picasso, whose work is a kind of diary. We don't think of Ang in that way, but in fact, the Moitessier portrait is a kind of diary of Ang's life through 12 years with this very rich, complicated, difficult relationship with his sitter, uh, the beautiful Madame de Moitessier. Now, there is the man himself uh, coming, as you know, to Paris in 1900, and again, basically for good in 1901. Uh, the subject of a number of exhibitions in uh, London over the past few years, the great Matisse Picasso at Tate, our own Picasso challenging the, the past on his relationship with old master paintings, and then the great Picasso 1932, uh, looking at this Annus Mirabilis in, uh, in Picasso's um, uh, life, uh, probably one of the most creative years of his long career, in any of which the Picasso picture we're now going to look at would have been a star um, work, uh, but was not lent to any of them, which makes it all the more extraordinary that we, we have it now on our wall beside Madame Montessier. At the, end of the war, at the end of the First War and of the great Cubist adventure that had begun uh, much earlier in the century, um, Picasso falls in <coughs> with the Ballet Russe, with Diaghilev's great uh, ballet, travels with them to, uh, to Rome uh, and takes part in mounting ballets there, designing stage sets, etc., uh, etc., and actually before they go, meets one of the ballerinas of the Ballet Russe, Olga Kokleva, uh, not herself Russian, actually, we make this distinction now, uh, Ukrainian, um, uh, whom he marries. She is the, uh, the first of two uh, uh, Madame Picassos, and uh, painting her, uh, he uh, is, is returns to order, it's called the return to order after the adventure of Cubism and after the end of the Second World War, that is to a representational art, an entirely uh, realist art with classical illusions. Uh, and you see here a photograph of Olga uh, and then one of the early paintings uh, of her uh, based directly on it, wonderfully unfinished. What more does he need uh, than, than this to, um, to show his beautiful wife? Or uh, indeed uh, from 1918, this serene, austere, almost Ang-like portrait of, um, uh, of Olga that we had here remarkably in our Picasso challenging the past the other year, just astonishing uh, image. Uh, and he and, and Olga remain married, living in, in great splendor. He is, by the 1920s, hugely wealthy, most famous artist in, in uh, Paris. But uh, 1932 is a great year for him in that he has his first retrospective exhibition, first at the Gallery Georges Petit and then at the Kunsthalle in, um, in Zurich. Uh, and in Zurich, he himself hangs the show. This is a great moment. Uh, much to his consternation, uh, Matisse had had his first retrospective um, uh, two years earlier. So uh, but now he was getting even. And he was asked how he was going to hang the exhibition in Zurich, and he said simply, badly by which he meant he was going to do it the way he wanted. He was going, chronology didn't interest him particularly. He was going to put together uh, things that he thought went together and told his story. And there you see uh, a, a photograph of this great exhibition. He was now, uh, had arrived, if you will, as the most famous artist in, uh, in the world. Uh, but a few years earlier in 1927, he had met this young 
uh, woman, Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, uh, 17 years of age when he, in his late 40s by that time, uh, literally picked her up on the street in Paris. Uh, and she soon became his mistress, and uh, she's a voluptuous young blonde, uh, and she uh, soon became a constant uh, in his art, as you see in, in many, many ways. But you begin, when you see these works uh, from 27 on, you begin to be able to recognize Marie Therese, wherever she shows up, the rounded forms that, as I say, sense of voluptuousness, even when she is entirely abstracted, turned into a sort of fish-like uh, figure, you still recognize Marie Therese there. Now, this is a very complicated moment um, because he never divorces Olga, nor she him. Uh, she dies, Madame Picasso. Um, and and it, it, it had to do with, I think, he finding out how expensive divorce was going to be. Um, so he provided uh, uh, very well for her. But throughout the early 30s, uh, Marie Therese is the dominant figure in his art, particularly in 1932, particularly in this extraordinary picture of her sleeping and ever uh, the tape. And I ask you to, to notice the way that he combines profile and full face in, uh, in one uh, in one uh, picture in this. And that would lead to this painting uh, at the end of 1932, probably after the retrospective exhibitions. It is the largest portrait of Marie Therese of uh, them uh, all. This is the Norton Simon uh, picture. Um, uh, Unlike Ang, and you will see it when you, when you go upstairs uh, with its absolutely enamel surface, this is like a three-dimensional object. It is, the paint is really pasted on, and it, it, it's like the surface of, a, of a, the moon almost. So thick is it in a areas, and so uh, completely does it stand, uh, uh, con contrast with other entirely flat areas, such as the red or the blue of the knee. But we recognize uh, two things. The, the hand, of course, derives from Madame Watessier. The profile in the mirror, and I'll come back to that in Madame Watessier, also derives from it. He had seen the picture in 1921 at the height of the so-called return to order. He had seen it in an Ang retrospective exhibition in Paris that year, and it had been like uh, something in his head, something in his ear, just staying there, wouldn't go away. And in 1932, 11 years later, this Ang imagery uh, explodes in his art, uh, particularly uh, in this great uh, picture. Um, she is looking up from her reading. She is uh, lost in thought. She is certainly uh, voluptuous, the naked uh, breasts uh, suggesting a carnal relationship entirely unlike that of uh, Ang and Madame Montessier. Nonetheless, that is the picture in the back of his mind as he reimagines a major seated portrait of someone in whom he is, with whom he is infatuated. He does not show it, and let me actually go back from it, he does not show it in 1932. He does not show it for, for four years until 1936. March of 1936, he puts it on view in Paris. Why the four-year wait? Uh, his art had moved on from them. This is his portrait of the following year of Lee Miller, uh, the photographer, the wife of Roland Penrose, and arguably one of the most beautiful women in the world. You would not know it from this, uh, this portrait. This was the surrealist direction in which his art was moving at that time, but in uh, 36, he cho chooses to, as it were, go back uh, and reveal this painting to the world in March of uh, 36, at the exact same time that our Madame Watessier 
was for sale in Paris, and the National Gallery under Kenneth Clark makes the acquisition a huge story in the news, not only in this country, but in France and indeed in America, that we had acquired uh, this extraordinary Ang, uh, Ang portrait. Um, and uh, it's at that moment that uh, Picasso decides to show this to the world for the first time. I think in a certain, that deep competitive urge of Picasso to say, you see, I was there first. I, I knew how great it was uh, before you did. Charles Dutuy, great French critic, also the son-in-law of Matisse, in that spring of 1936, writes an essay in the French press that says, this relates to that. The Picasso is based on the Ang. You have to see the two of them together. That's why I, when I say this exhibition took 86 years to, uh, uh, to put on, it's because in 1936, Dutuy said, you must see them side by side to understand uh, what, is, um, what is going on uh, here. And in fact, Dutuy's essay is then published in the Listener, the, the BBC magazine for people who listen to radio, which was just about anybody uh, in 1936. So in fact, this is not some new art historical comparison. It may have been the first thing that anybody in this country knew about our, Moita, our Ang was that Picasso had painted a variation on it. Uh, and here I, we, we contrast it with this um, uh, quote from Ang himself, who is there among the greats, who is not imitated, nothing is made with nothing. He would have been perfectly happy to think of this young whippersnapper in a future generation who had used what he had created for his own art. So there you see the, uh, the two of them. And my final point will simply be to show you the um, uh, reflection of Madame Montessier in her mirror, now completely unnaturalistic. If you're sitting at an angle to a mirror, you do not throw a reflection in pure profile. That would not be reality, but he wants us to see her twice. He is absolutely, from the beginning, willing to break with the rules of realism uh, in order to make his, uh, his point. Um, it's the same with the hand. It's just a strangeness to which Picasso is responding almost as if to say, uh, in his own mere reflection and so much else, I can work with this. I can make something new out of this great and strange uh, masterpiece of the 1850s. And I will stop there. Thank you.